Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Afso, and I am the Chief Imagination Officer at Kidogo. Kidogo is a social enterprise that provides high quality, affordable, early childhood care. And the problem with the way social entrepreneurship is defined today, everybody has their own definition, right? We asked three people in the audience, they all came up with different definitions for what is a social enterprise. And I know some of you guys come from the public sector, some of you are you know, civil society engagers, some of you are entrepreneurs, everybody has a different perspective of what does that mean, right? Somebody from the public sector might say, ah, social enterprise. They're just trying to make money, but they don't want to pay taxes, right? Somebody from the civil society sector says, you know, they're just nonprofits, but they're nonprofits who want a sexier title, isn't it, right? And the entrepreneurs are saying, yeah, 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 I'm a social entrepreneur, right? Every entrepreneur thinks they're a social entrepreneur. So what I'm saying today is social enterprise isn't the solution to everything. It's an interesting solution, don't get me wrong. I'm a big advocate for social entrepreneurship, but it's not always the right answer. And Maggie, who asked me to come speak today, wanted me to communicate to the group here. You guys are all my age, some of you are probably older, some of you are probably younger than me, right? So there, I, I'm, not, I'm no more experienced than you, I'm no more educated than you. This is a discussion, so I wanna hear your thoughts, I wanna hear your questions. But she wanted me to communicate to you what are the benefits and the negatives of running a social enterprise, and what does that mean? So I'll tell you a little bit about my story and, and where I came from and, and why I'm here and what I'm doing this thing. So I'm actually East African by background. My mom is born in Bea in Tanzania. Who here is from Tanzania? Ooh, ooh. Yeah. Mambo Vipi. Ah, sawa. So, so, so I, you know, my mom was from Tanzania. And when she was growing up, she did her, she did her secondary school in Dar es Salaam. And um, thought, you know, if I want to make a better life for my family, I can't do it here in Tanzania. And she moved. You know, she was lucky. She had the ability with her family support, with whatever, she moved to Canada. That's the reason I used Canada before as my example. So I was born in Canada. I grew up in Canada. I was raised in Canada. I went through school in Canada. You know, I was very fortunate. I, didn't, I never really had to think about if my education was good, uh, I never really had to figure out how to pay for my education because education there was considerably cheaper. There's lots of scholarships, there's lots of stipends from the government. And at the end of it, I got a great job because there's lots of employment opportunities too. Why is it that people from, from here, from East Africa, why, does it why do we feel like we have to leave in order to get a better life? That was always something in my head. And just around that same time, I was working at a consulting firm, the Boston Consulting Group uh, in Toronto. And uh, a friend of mine named Sabrina called me. And she was describing that picture I showed you earlier of a baby care center. She said, Afsal, oh, so you won't believe what I just saw. I was in this community called Malolongo, just outside of Nairobi. And I walked into this baby care center. It's like a daycare center, but it's in someone's home. And I just tell you, there was 20 kids, 30 kids in there. They were all babies, but they were all quiet. They weren't asleep. They were just quiet. It was eerie how quiet they were. And the reason that they were quiet was because they had learned not to cry anymore. Because when they cry, they get beat. And if they laugh, they get beat. And if they yell, they get beat. So they just stay quiet. And sometimes, if they're too rowdy, they're given a sleeping pill. Now, children at the age of three, children at the age of two, their brains are developing so fast. 
If you're giving them sleeping pills, those are full of all kinds of toxins. What are we doing? What kind of damage are we doing to their brains, right? So we started thinking, okay, what are we going to do about it? Now, you know, a lot of people would say, okay, let's, let's put out a fundraiser, let's raise $100, $1,000, and let's give some great toys to that center, and, and let's improve, let's paint the center, let's do all these great things to the center. And then what? What happens after? Because one year from then, that paint will fa fade, those toys will break, and that caregiver will still be beating those children. So nothing will change, right? So, so what good would that do if we were to go out and fundraise for it? Everybody, everybody can do something like that, it's, it's easy. But what good is that gonna do by itself? So we started looking around the world. We took a year of research. I was still working, I still wanted to make my income, you know? And we looked around the world. What are people doing about early childhood development? What are people thinking about when they're dealing with children under the age of five? And what we found was that it was really important for whatever solution we came up with to be holistic. It needed to think about the child as a whole person. It's not just about education. It's not just about health. It's not just about social, you know, them feeling like an, an attachment or an engagement. It's about everything. It's about all of those things. And normally, when we talk about children under the age of three, we think about them as, did they get their vaccinations? That's it. Did they do exclusive breastfeeding? That's it. And it's when they turn three, or maybe when they th turn five or six, that we say, ah, are they in primary? Are they learning their ABCs? Are they learning their one, two, threes? That's it. There's nothing in between. But those are the most important years. So we said, and I, at the time, I had done a lot of reading on social entrepreneurship. There's a guy named Muhammad Yunus. If you don't know who he is, and you're interested in the topic of social entrepreneurship, look him up. Because he's effectively, in my mind, the guy who invented the practice of social entrepreneurship, or at least coined it. And Muhammad Yunus created a bank in Bangladesh called Grameen. He was the first person to do microfinance. Now, microfinance is one type of social enterprise or one type of social business. But it wasn't the only type. And so from that, there's evolved so many different business models. But generally, social enterprises work in one of three ways. Does anybody know which slide I'm referring to? You can create impact in one of three ways. What are they? Can somebody shout out one of them? You gotta shout it out, I'm really deaf. Product. product? So product or service, yeah. Value, Value chain? Profit sharing. profit sharing. So the product or service, right? We talked about this already. This is if you're trying to benefit the market that you're selling to directly. So you've created a product or a service that has a social impact in and of itself, right? And you want to improve the lives of the people you're serving. So generally these are people, generally when you start one of these social enterprises that's focused on product or service, you're working with a low income population or you're working with other, other type of marginalized population. So you might work with um, people who have a disability or some kind of a handicap, right? And they become the target of your product or your service. Or maybe they are a, a, an, er, a, an ethnic minority in your country. Right? Somebody who doesn't have access to the general market can't access that same service for some reason. The second was value chain, right? So value chain was all about how you produce that good or service, how you create the product. So we talked about fair trade coffee. Fair trade coffee is all about how you produce it. You employ people at a wage that they can live on. You use green processing in the supply chain and you create this product that you sell to any market. It doesn't matter, right? You're not trying to impact the, it's not like by giving them coffee they're gonna be so much healthier. It's just coffee. It's the same as every other coffee. But it's how you produced it that makes you social. That's different. And the third we talked about was profit sharing. And for profit sharing we talked about somebody like Tom's Shoes. Tom's Shoes, the, the concept here is very simple. If you buy a pair of shoes, a second pair of shoes is delivered to a child in some developing country, and therefore you should feel really good about yourself and pat yourself on the back, right? Um, and that's because that company says, we won't take all of the profit, we're gonna allocate some portion of our profit, or all of our profit, maybe, to creating some kind of social good, but I'm gonna donate that money after. It's not linked to what I actually do, right? The shoes aren't the social part, right? It's not like the guy who bought the shoes is now have, has such a much you know, better, better quality of life. 
it's it's really about what happens with the with the profit of those shoes. Are we all okay? Are we all, we're all together. Am I getting boring yet? Are you sure? Who's bored? Just just the two guys who work with me. For anybody who wants to ask questions after or meet anybody who's actually working at a social enterprise, this is Jamo on the right, James and Marto Martin on the left, uh, and and they. They'll be able to tell you the real ins and outs about social enterprise because I'm just the one who goes and speaks about it, and they're the ones who actually do the real work, right? So, so we decided we're going to start a social enterprise for this challenge, and we thought, okay, the product or service itself is is a benefit; it has a social benefit, right? We know that the people who get access to the early childhood care and education will benefit. They themselves will be stronger. Uh, children, as a result of it, they'll do better in school, they'll, they'll have better health, they'll perform better in later life, they'll get a better income. So we're going to be a product and service social enterprise. Except, who do you employ to provide that service? Right? So if we're working in low-income communities, we're working in urban slums, we're working in, uh, in Kibera, in Kangemi, Kawangware, Mathare, who do I employ? to give that service? Do I bring people from Canada and the US? No. Do I take great ECD teachers from Gigiri and from Kangemi, or uh, sorry, from, from you know, these, these high income areas, Kilimani, and bring them into the center? No. They don't understand it. They don't understand what, the, what it's like there. So we employ people from within those communities as well, right? And we train them in early childhood development. We train them in the skills that they need in order to improve the quality of life of those children. And not only do we provide those services ourselves, so you know, we, we run a, an interesting model called Hub and Spoke. What a Hub and Spoke model is is that we run our own centers. They're called hubs. They serve between 50 and 100 children every day. They come to us from 7 a.m. in the morning. James will confirm this. 7 a.m. in the morning until 6 p.m. And we feed them three meals a day and they're with us the whole day. And we do class time, we do outdoor time, we do uh, nap time, everything that a child needs in order to reach their full potential. But that's just the tip of the iceberg because every time I open a center, it costs $10,000 or $5,000 to start a center and I try to make it break even, right? This is the social enterprise part. Parents pay a fee, the fees when I collect them all together is able to cover the cost of the salaries and the rent and the food but I can only reach 50 or 100 kids every time I do that. Every center I build, it take, which takes us six months to set up, which takes us a lot of money to set up, can only serve 100 kids. And there's two and a half million children in East Africa under the age of five living in urban slums. So will I ever reach them? No, there's no way, right? No matter how much money was donated to us, we just won't reach two and a half million. It's gonna be too big. So the second piece of our model is this spokes. And what spokes are is, I told you about baby care centers. They're these home-based child care centers that are run by a local woman who lives in that same informal settlement and takes care of between five and maybe 25 kids in her home or maybe in a church basement or in some small room beside a school. So we partner with them. We partner with those home-based child care centers and we bring those caregivers into our center once a month for training. They get training in child development. They get training in how to manage a classroom. They get training in positive discipline, how not to hit a child when they're misbehaving. They get training in nutrition. James is actually our nutritionist, so he's the guy who does all that training. They get training in business skills, right? What is the, how do I run this as a business so I can actually make a little bit of money and be sustainable? So now, our one hub in Kangemi serves, uh, serves 50, 50 families or 50 children but we work with five spokes, five of these home-based baby care centers, and they serve 85 children between them. So now I've more than doubled my impact, but I haven't invested any more money. I haven't, I haven't created a new center. It didn't take six months to launch. It's, it's much easier, um, but it's a better route to scale. Does that make sense? So social entrepreneurship for me is about three things then. One is about sustainability. We talked about that before, right? You're using some kind of business principles to make yourself more sustainable. The second is about scalability. Can you reach the market demand that you're trying to reach? If you're gonna be a social enterprise, it's, it's rare that you just wanna focus on 50 people. You're really trying to get something massive. That's the reason you use business principles. If it's just 50, you can always find donations to help those 50. 
But when you're trying to help two and a half million, you really need to think about sustainability about su at, at a different level. And then the third is about impact. So what kind of impact are you creating? And we also talked about that a little bit. So one of the things we also talked about earlier was where do we fit on this spectrum uh, between profit mission or social mission and profit mission and how there's a whole spectrum there. But legal structures today, ha have you ever heard of anybody that's, en that's incorporated as a social enterprise? There's no such thing. In 99.9% .9 of countries, except for the UK, I think, you can't incorporate as anything other than a not-for-profit or a for-profit, right? It only puts you on this side of the spectrum or this side of the spectrum. So if you're a social enterprise operating somewhere in the middle, you have to make a decision. How do I want to register? How do I look to other people? And you're going to confuse people, right? When I go into Kangemi or I go into Kibera and I start this amazing childcare center, people are like, wow, this place is great. I want to enroll my kid. And I say, great, it's uh, 1,500 shillings per month. They go, I have to pay? I have to pay for this? It's not a nonprofit. It's not an NGO? I said, yeah, you know, it's, it's a price that's affordable. It helps pay, uh, pay the teachers, helps pay for the food, right? That's, that's how we work. You confuse people. People are not used to that yet. Same thing with donors, right? Sometimes you'll find a donor and they'll get, say, oh, great, you're doing some good work in early childhood development. Here's $10,000. I want you to go start a center and provide as much services as you can to 100 kids for one year. We say, we're not going to work exactly like that. We're going to use your 10000 to start a center, and then that center is going to be sustainable because we're going to charge fees. They're all surprised, too. Like, what do you mean? You're going to charge fees after I've given you all this money? What do you, what do you mean? And it's, it's about sustainability, right? You have to explain to them that I want this to go on beyond your donation. Your donation will multiply not just for this one year, but for the year after that, and for 10 years down the road, and for 20 years down that road, that center will still be there and it'll be sustainable. That's what we're trying to achieve with social entrepreneurship. But it's not all easy, right? I've only talked about the good parts of social entrepreneurship so far. So I wanna brainstorm with you guys a little bit and then we'll move directly to questions because I really wanna hear from you guys. What are you thinking about? What questions do you have? What ideas do you have in trying to brainstorm how we make those social enterprises or not? But I wanted to brainstorm with you guys a little bit. What do you think are the pros or the advantages of being a social enterprise? And what are the negatives? What are the disadvantages of being a social enterprise? What are the challenges of being a social enterprise? What do you guys think from your own experience, from your own work? Beautiful. That's actually a true, true statement. And, and the best way to phrase that one is really thinking about the diversity of funding you can get. So if you're a social enterprise, you're not limited to just you know, debt or equity investment. You're not just limited to the funds from your own operations. You can get grants. Right? There are grants out there that are focused on social enterprises. And oftentimes, those grants are the easiest way to start up because you don't have to worry about paying that person back. You don't have to worry about interest rates. You don't have to worry about all these challenges that are incurred there. You're just working off of grant money. But it also is a disadvantage because grants come with, the, they are their own curse. When somebody gives you a grant, what they want to know up front, and we have a lot of grants, <laughs> as Mart Marto can attest to, okay? When we get a grant, let's say it's a grant for $20,000, we have to tell that donor exactly what we're going to do with $20,000. Over the next year, we're going to spend $14,000 on this, we're going to spend $5,000 on this, we're going to spend $1,000 on this, and I have to stick to it. Even if everything changes, even if the world turns upside down, I still have to spend the money in that way. Now, as an enterprise, as a, as a, as a business, you want to be a lean entrepreneur, right? All the entrepreneurs in the audience know how important it is to be able to pivot all of a sudden. You learn something about your market, it's different from what you thought, so you have to go a different way. With a grant, you can't do that. The grant, you're stuck to where you are. Most grants. This is not all grants. There are some people who are starting to understand this idea of lean and how to pivot and those kinds of things. But most still want you to spend your money in exactly how you told them you were going to. And then you're probably going to have to spend 
10, 20, 30 percent of your that budget that you got, the twenty thousand dollars, on adding someone to your team to account for where you spent that money, to write a report for the donor to tell them where you spent that money, to write a, d <laughs> a report to the donor to say how did you, what impact did you have, to measure the impact that you've had. So now you didn't get twenty thousand dollars; you actually got fifteen because the rest of it got spent on trying to report back to the donor. So it has its benefits and it has its curses. Anybody else? Anybody else have ideas? Yeah. Um, on the cons, I think it's um, increasing your market, because especially if you are establishing an enterprise in a community that doesn't know you or, that or doesn't recognize you, it's quite hard for them to gain your trust, because most probably if you tell them that they have to pay and you're an NGO, they technically think of you as a con artist out there either trying to kidnap their children or trying to con them off their cash. Marto, James, anything, anything there resonate to you guys? Does this sound familiar? Very familiar. Very familiar, says James. That's the exact challenge we have, right? To the point we talked about earlier, when communities see you, and usually when it's a Mzungu-led organization, right? They see this Mzungu out in the field wearing a nice shirt, they think something's free, for sure. Right? It doesn't matter that my, my family's from Tanzania. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's something free coming here. Let's stick around. There'll, there'll be something. So we have to operate like a business. And you can ask these guys, I, never go to the, I don't go to the field anymore because that perception is because of me. It's because of the way that we operate. So now in the field, they just see people from their own local community. And they've started this school, and yes, it has a cool name, but all of the teachers are from their, are, are their neighbors. All of the children are from the local community. All of the materials are locally developed. There's nothing from outside. There's nothing we've imported. There's nothing that's in Arabic because it's imported from Dubai. Everything is from here. And that makes a difference. But it is a challenge. You're absolutely right. Any other ideas? Yeah, in the back. It's OK. Yell. Oh, for the video. Uh, thank you for noticing us at the back. Uh, <coughs> for me, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, for the prone, pro, for the pros, um, it's very important for a social enterprise. You know, there's no greater way for an entrepreneur to impact your society uh, than with the, than by using the social enterprise. Uh, the pro for me will be that uh, you will be directly impacting somebody's life and changing children's life. Those children might not know it later on in their life when they are 30. But because of what you did when they were three, they are able to be creative and become good entrepreneurs like some of us. So for me, I think that's a really good pro. And a plus on it is that you are able to sustain yourself. So I believe it's awesome. And, and when you say I'm able to, yeah, everybody, that's, I agree. That's, that's why we do what we do, right? That's why we do what we do. The, the whole, it all comes back to what I said earlier about social mission. The reason you do the work is for the social impact. Right Now, the last point is you're able to sustain yourself. I'm knocking on wood because it's not as easy as it seems. Just because you charge revenues, just because you, you, uh, you have all of those, you know, these income streams, doesn't mean you're necessarily fully sustainable, that you can sustain yourself. Okay? The, the challenge with being a social enterprise is you often have to balance between impact and sustainability. So an example of that is in our centers, there is a pair of twins who came in. They were 18 months old, so they're a year and a half old, but they looked like they were six months old. They were so malnourished. They were so stunted for growth. Their bodies were, were you know, we thought if they, don't, if they leave this center now, if they leave this center now, they're going to die. They're going to die out there. And so we had to make a decision. That mother could not pay. She, she wasn't able to or she could make some small, small, small contribution, but it's never going to cover the costs of those children. And those children will cost us more than a normal child because we're going to put money into medicine and we're going to put money into the right type of food for them, we're going to buy milk, we're going to buy all these things that not, everybody, not every child gets because we want to save these children's lives. Now, do I do that or do I be sustainable and think about the business and the long-term sustainability of it? Every day we face those challenges, okay? And, you know, I can say it easily from up here because I'm just talking about the stories that make it to me, but these guys who work in the field, they see it every single day, and they have to make those trade-offs, and it's not that simple. 
every single time is heart-wrenching, and you have to make a trade-off at some point. So that's the downside to that. Sorry, I didn't want to bring the whole room down, but I feel like I did. Any other ones? Up here in the front? And I'll get to you last, and then we'll go to questions. Yeah? Um, I'm going to give my experience with the organization I work with. Um, we wanted to get an hybrid of the of, uh, uh, civic participation of young people in a society because we are looking at the sustainability part of it. I was particularly tasked with the um, alumni engagement so that they can be active in, in that. And one of the major problems that I'm facing even up to today is mobilization. When you go there, the first mistake I did was to go with the a Muzungu lady. So they thought this dude has brought for us money. Then when I said, now we want you to come and we start this community service, um, uh, I went sleep a little bit to tell them it's going to be an hybrid, we want profit, and also we're not going to pay you initial, but if all goes well, we will share something. They began to back up. So the biggest challenge is mobilization. Initial mobilization is a big problem. I don't know whether you guys also face it, but to me, this is what I think it is going on. Mobilizing people, telling them that it's going to be an hybrid model. Because uh, NGOs are known for free service. Civic participation is free. Now you're going to bring this social enterprise kind of thing, making it to come. The community will not see it that way. The first thing is, I think, is to first go to the community, interact with them in a different platform, make them embrace small contribution for bigger impact to them in the future, for them to embrace the, the, the community. So as uh, much as you want to start it now, it becomes a challenge because you will not get the res human resources you need. Yeah, you're, you're very much right. That's uh, just, if you can pass the mic that way. Yeah, I think, I think you're very much right that getting people on board, getting buy-in about the idea of social entrepreneurship is very tough. It's a foreign concept. People don't understand what you mean by it. And there's a positive to that one. And the positive is nonprofits, right? How much they spend probably 30% of their money or 40% of their money measuring their impact of the other 60% of the money, right? Who's heard of M&E before? Monitoring and evaluation, right? You have to do some monitoring and evaluation to determine how well did you do in the product that you gave away for free, right? Now, as a social enterprise, if you're asking people to pay, it's a different ball game because if the product or service that you're delivering is not something that they value, it's not something that they care about, they're not gonna pay for it, right? They won't, they won't buy it. If the quality of the ECD centers we were starting was not, like if ECD didn't matter at all to parents, they didn't, they didn't care about whether, where they left their children, why would they pay us more than anybody else to care for their children at our centers? It's because we found what was important to them. And when you're able to deliver what's important value to the customer, you're creating social impact that way, right? The, there's less effort to think about, oh, what impact have we created? We know that these parents find value in what we're doing because they pay us to do it, right? They're not getting it for free, and now we have to gauge, did they really appreciate it? Was our money worthwhile spent? No, they paid for it. So they found value in it, and they keep on coming back, so they keep on finding value in it. So that's the benefit of being a social enterprise there. Thank you very much. I've interacted with Kidogo before, and uh, I'm amazed. It's awesome you guys are here. And Thank you. Um, one thing I know about social enterprise, it, it empowers the quote-unquote poor. You know, for a long time, people think, like, because you live in the slum, you cannot afford it. And people live in that mentality, we are poor, and you cannot be able to give a, a good education to our children. And one thing Central Enterprise shows is these guys have money. You can be able, like, I like what uh, Synergy, they do. They use poo to make money, for, you know? Synergy, yeah. Oh, Synergy, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So they use, you know, stuff like that. And it is, um, I think it's one of the principles in the SDGs that has come out. The only way we're going to achieve SDGs is when profit-making and non-profit come together to make a, a partnership that is, for the better, for, for the good of the planet and good of the people. And I love your model. We'll talk after this. These guys, 
they, they, they're tired of me talking about children, so we'll talk after this. I'm sure they're more tired of me talking. So I'm actually going to open up for questions now, because I feel like I've talked enough. And I've tried to give you as much as I, as I can about what we do. Uh, I'll reiterate the three, the three main topics I want you to remember is, what is a social enterprise? It has a social mission, but uses business principles to do what it does. It creates impact in one of three ways. As a product or service, value chain, or some kind of profit sharing. And it could be anywhere on this spectrum between totally for-profit to totally non-profit. It sits somewhere in the middle between those things. And that doesn't mean that if it's re we're registered both as a non-profit and as a for-profit. So we have a US entity that's a non-profit. We have a Kenyan entity that's a for-profit. You know, there's no clear structure there because there isn't a social enterprise registry. We talked about that a little bit. So those are the three points I really wanted to get across and that there's benefits and negatives to being a social enterprise. Just because you're starting something, it doesn't have to be a social enterprise. It can be a model you, you may want to use, but it's not the right model for everything. Um, for example, in emergency or disaster situations, social enterprises does, doesn't usually work, right? Because you're dealing with a population who's so marginalized at that point in time, there is no money anywhere else, you can't afford to you know, market your service or your product to them. It's really about delivering them life-saving services at the moment. On the other end of the spectrum, if it's early childhood development, if it's education, if it's healthcare, and there's some affordability to it, if they're able to pay for it, then it can be a social enterprise. So you just need to gauge what's the reason that you're starting this. Are you starting this to make money? Or are you starting this to create some social impact? And then how will you do it? What are the steps you will take to do it? So I'll open it up for questions right now. And uh, please feel free if you have any. Uh, my name is David. I'm from Kenya. I'm uh, really inspired by what you do. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, rather actually, uh, I'd say it half a suggestion, uh, half a question. Uh, have you ever thought of uh, uh, adding an additional business model where I hear from Jenny that your <laughs> care centers are pretty good and of high quality, and you've done a lot of research in early childhood development. Uh, what if uh, you could add an additional business model whereby you also have the same service for the middle class, like in a country like Kenya, which is charged at a higher rate than you would charge it in the slum area or the low income areas. And uh, the profits that you make are over and above that are channeled back into creating more centers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have thought about that business model. It's one we explore pretty frequently. Um, it's called cross-subsidization. There's a term for it. There's a lot of companies that use it. If you're interested in that type of business model, look up an organization called Arvind Eye Care Centers. They're based in India. They do the same thing. They do eye surgeries, but they charge rich people $10,000 for an eye surgery, and they charge you know, the lowest income people $1 or $2 for the same surgery, right? even if it's below their cost. So the cross-subsidization model is a great model to use. Uh, it's a very strong one. It's one that a lot of social enterprises use. It's one we've considered using. But we're so early in our evolution. We're two years in, right? So we started in 2014. It's now 2016. We've only been doing this for two years. We only have two centers. We have a staff of 20 people, uh, including all of our teachers, all of our, all of our support staff. And if we were to start a new one in Sa South Sea, Right, we opened a center in South Sea at the same quality or even higher quality than our existing centers and charged quite a bit more. You know, we charge 1,500 bob per, per month right now in Kibera. We could charge 15,000 bob in South Sea and still, and still get customers, right? Doing the same, roughly the same quality. The problem is we'll get so focused on the 15,000 bob center, the place that's serving South Sea, that we dis get distracted from the low-income communities. It's easy to start chasing that because it becomes you know, better money, better profitability, better sustainability, in you, there's a risk of losing focus on the core population you're there to serve. So we, we've kept it in mind. It's something we are exploring. It's something I imagine if you came back to me in 10 years from now, we will be doing. But for now, we're really focused on the low income. We cover our head office costs with grants, but our operations on the ground are really covered by revenues, and so we're sustainable on the ground, but everything from uh, upwards is, is grant funded for now. 
my friend in the back who needs acknowledgement. Hello? There you okay. go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, mine, uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but uh, in the scale that you drew, or was that was on the slide, there was like the one that is not for profit, and then it extended all the way for for profit. Those are different scales uh, for organizations and for companies. Uh, my question or my comment is uh, about uh, especially the ones that specifically are for po uh, for profit. You realize that uh, there are some that are really in the service business, but then again, they really it's like they don't know that they are social enterprise because the kind of service they provide is uh, essential and at the same time very critical. Let's say, for example, uh, a clinic uh, in one of the uh, Kibera or Madare, the one that provides uh, 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 maternal services or even sexual reproductive uh, health advices for young teens and mothers. They don't necessarily consider themselves social entrepreneurs, but in actual sense, they are, they, they, they are actually for profit but they don't see themselves as social entrepreneurs. So I re I'm really confused when you say that there is a scale because I feel like there's some entrepreneurs that really don't know they, are, they belong to the social enterprise, uh, entrepreneur bracket, so to speak. So I think, uh, is that a comment or a question? Mm -hmm. anyway, that's it's a little bit of both. I, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I actually have a theory, and this is my crazy socialist Bernie Sanders Afsal speaking instead of you know the much more moderate uh, Hillary Clinton Afsal speaking. Um, but I actually think that every, historically, if we look back 100 years, every business that was started was a social business, was a social enterprise. Because when you were, when you were starting a business, you were doing it to fulfill some kind of social need. People need to get from point A to point B, so we're gonna pave a road for them. That was social at a time, right? Um, these people need health care, so we're going to start a clinic or a hospital. That was social. That is social, right? Um, these people need a cleaning product for their hands. They need soap so they can wash their hands, so they can be clean, so they don't get sick. That was social. Would I call P&G or Unilever because they make soaps today? Would we call them social enterprises? No. No. Because their motive now is profit. The reason that you do it is for profit. The fact that somebody's cleaning their hands and getting less sick because of it is just how you market yourself or just a byproduct of that. But if the focus of what you're doing, if the reason that you got into it was for profit, I don't think that that's a so social enterprise anymore, even if you're providing some kind of a slightly social benefit in some way. Now, a clinic in Kibera, I think, in and of itself has a social enterprise written all over it. And I'm gu I guarantee you, any clinic in Kibera that provides sexual health and self sexual reproduction services has probably gotten a grant from somewhere and probably has been called the social enterprise by somebody, right? Um, but I think, I think your point is valid, is that because there's a spectrum, some people who are so social enterprises don't know that they are, and some people who call themselves social enterprises are not. Uh, and you just have to be cautious of that. You have to be the one to gauge, do I believe this person who says they're a social entrepreneur, or do I, did I find somebody here who doesn't think they're a social entrepreneur who I think is? And, and what difference does it make if they are or not, right? The only reason that it's important is if you're going out to raise funding and you want to apply for something social enterprise related, or if you want to support a cause, is it a social enterprise or not social enterprise? But other than that, it's just a title. It's just, it's just a label that somebody wears. And, and we'll be here for about five more minutes. Uh, so if you have questions for me or either for uh, James or Martin, feel free. Uh, and then we'll, we'll probably take off after that. <laughs>